Hello everyone. For today's session, I'm going to be quickly talking about diagramming in system design. System design is quite a challenge. There's a lot of juggling to do. There's a lot of things you need to focus on. And the more senior you are, the more you need to direct the flow of the conversation. So given the limited time, effective diagramming is actually a key edge in system design. Because like the old saying, a picture is worth a thousand words. So let us take a look at how I do diagramming for system design and my template. Let's get started. <laughs> First thing is to have your own favorite diagramming tool. I recommend Excalibur because it doesn't need registration. You can simply create it and share it. It's very simple, but what you'll find is the simpler it is, the easier it is to focus on the content rather than formatting. If the company actually have their own tool or they want you to use Google Doc or something else, I would say ask them if you can use this instead. And also if the company or the interviewer is lazy and just say, let's talk through it or draw a diagram on a paper and show me, I would highly recommend pushing back a little bit and just suggesting to use Excalibur. Job. It is really for your benefit and give you the edge. So let's talk about how I do my diagram. As you can see, I have a template sort of set up for you over here. You can see that my diagram usually only use boxes and arrows. Boxes um, is components and arrows are the interactions. So here in my template, I basically have a few things. But in my box, I have a component name and then in brackets, I write the stack. And then below that, I use freeform text to write the detail. For arrows, it is an interaction, so I will describe the interaction below it. Let us take a look at each component and how I put together those names in a very formulaic, very templated way, which just make it really simple and consistent for the, for the interviewer. <laughs> so first of all, component name consists of domains and function plus a type suffix. I will use it, give you an example. User service. Okay. Another one would be, <laughs> Uh, let's say we are doing a recording software. So um, offer notification, sending, sender, uh, send worker. Uh, let us go give another example. Maybe let's call it the uh, favorite most, let's call it the most popular song cache. So those are examples of component names. Um, let's take a look at the different part. Uh, the first thing is it can either have a domain or a function. Uh, a domain is simply a noun that represents a more broader set of uh, concept. For example, a user is a domain, a post could be a domain, a comment could be a domain, a customer could be a domain. So if you have like a customer service, it will have a likely a lot of endpoint dealing with the customer and that is going to be in the form of a service. Functions are verbs, so they are a little bit more details. A lot of the times, the more involved functionality, especially those that are backed by a specific database or queues or streams, uh, will be named by function uh, to be a little bit more refined. Uh, for example, instead of saying there is a user stream, um, which you know, sounds like it contains a bunch of user record and captures change for all the users, uh, you may have something called the user notification change stream um, that is very specific about what kind of event is in there. So functions typically are verbs. You could have something like notification, which probably is sending a notification somewhere. You can have filtering, which sounds like a, a component that takes a bunch of input and drops some of them and keeps some of them. You may also have something called aggregation, which implies it's going to take a bunch of input and then it's going to give you a reduced set of aggregated output somehow. So domains or function here. Uh, in my example, user is a domain. Offer is a domain, but here we also have a specific function. So instead of saying offer worker, uh, which you know you still doesn't tell you what it is, it's now saying offer notification send worker. So it is a worker that sends notification about offers. Um, you can, from the name, already kind of know, uh, maybe it's using recruiting when you get an offer, perhaps. Uh, or maybe you're making a deal in real estate, right? And it sends the offer. Um, but at least it's better than a very generic name, like service, right? Or, or rest for service. Um, most popular sound cache is another example. So this one is a cache, that's the type suffix. 
but uh, most popular sound is specifically kind of tells you what this does or what's contained in here. Um, so this is the domain and the function. Now, the suffix is of the type, and this is critical. Uh, it is very important for you to use a consistent set of naming. Uh, I have my favorite one, you probably have yours. What I don't recommend here is to say server. Server is really a lower level construct. A lot of think, people have been thinking of server, they think of a specific host in your fleet. So I'm gonna talk about more lower level concepts in future sessions, but here to avoid confusion, I would not say server. Um, perhaps I would say web server, but um, I like to use the word front end uh, as a suffix. So let's go through it. A service is typically either a RESTful service or like a GraphQL service that gets invoked by clients. A application or front end implies something that's used by the user. So in your diagram, you really, the incoming arrow really uh, should come from the users and maybe it will call a service somehow. Queues and streams um, are a specific type of component and what they do is they have a producer uh, that's before them and they have a consumer that's after them. You have a store, which is just a name for database. Some people call it the database. I like to reserve database uh, for relational database. Um, I like to use star in a general way uh, to talk about all kinds of persistence. And then worker is uh, a little bit odd. Sometimes a worker may be coming out of a queue or a stream, so it kind of is also a consumer of sort. Sometimes a worker actually gets triggered by a cron job. So you may have a scheduler and then draw an arrow toward the worker. And then consumer and publisher, um, you know, in specific situations, your component may be uh, dedicated to consuming or publishing, so you would use this. Finally, a cache. A cache is simply a kind of store that is uh, less durable typically, but faster. So uh, this is how I use type suffix to clar clarify what kind of component am I dealing with. Now, uh, in the bracket below it, what I like to do is I like to write a stack, uh, or maybe the concrete technology is a better term. So here I would take a reference technology, I would throw it in there. If I haven't yet really decided, I may leave it empty for now, uh, or I may put in a placeholder and then later on revisit it. Um, I may say MySQL, and then later on I may update it to be DynamoDB if it's clear that it's a key value storage. But in any case, a stack gives you a way to draw a more concrete picture to the interviewer without committing to it, without actually coupling your actual abstract type uh, with the concrete Im implementation. So I do recommend putting that in your box as well. So here you may have something like um, user service and it might be uh, rest for service. Okay. Uh, let's use another example. <laughs> Maybe you have something called uh, most um, popular uh, song hourly aggregation worker, right? And then it might be of the type link worker, okay? And um, like just looking at it, you may know there is something here called uh, song um, rating event stream, right? So, you know, song rating event uh, is the content, right? It's a, not it's a function. And then the stream is saying it's kind of like a stream and you may have something called Kafka, right? Which is the uh, concrete type, uh, drawing an arrow between the two. Sometimes you don't need to mark it, sometimes you do, right? So let's say if you want to mark it, you can basically say um, uh, events, you know, basically uh, read from, right? So, or send uh, gets consumed by. So this is the relationship. Um, this stream gets consumed by that, right? So I like to typically do this. Uh, now I jumped ahead a little bit, right? So let's come back to this. Uh, interaction is specifically the arrows. Interactions, um, sometimes you don't really need to talk about it. Sometimes you do. So typically arrows could mean you're calling a service. So in this case, uh, it's a client calling a service, right? So here you may have a a front end calling the user service, make a make a API call somehow. You may have um, a producer that uh, emit an event to a stream and then the stream would get consumed by a, a consumer, which is what I have drawn here. Uh, you could have making a query. So one thing of note here is the direction of your arrows. You really want to be consistent here. 
So there is typically two ways to do it. Um, depending on the different type of system descent question, I use one or the other, but I always make sure I'm consistent within the same interview or the same session. Uh, so one way to do it is a data flow, right? So the arrow you draw would be the flow of data. Uh, in the case of sending an event, I mean, it will be from the sender to the consumer or to the queue. Uh, but in the case of making a GET query, uh, you would actually draw the arrow in a reversed way, right? So maybe the front end is making a call to the user service, but if you're doing data flow, then you may be uh, something like uh, provide, you know, serve uh, user data too, right? So that's the data flow way of doing it. Um, but the other way you can do it is by triggering, which typically is my favorite. So in this case, you would have query, right, for user data. So whoever initiate the, the the action will be on the on the left side, I guess in this case, and then the arrow side will be the direction of your your triggering. So who told who to do what? Um, now. Um, just be consistent and choose one. The last thing uh, in, that I want to talk about today is the details, right? So typically after drawing those box and arrows, I like to use free text to write some detail below. I'm gonna go through two most popular things I write down. One is if we're dealing with the API, then I'm gonna, uh, sorry, a web service or other kind of API. Uh, what I do is I usually write a signature for the API, right? That's simply method name, which have to be a verb usually and then input and output. Um, if it's important, then the input and output would have a type. And if it's a complex type, like a, a domain, right? For example, maybe uh, this user data would be uh, get user, and the input would be user ID, which is a string, and then the output might be, uh, let's say, you know, let's just go an example, get user. Uh, this will be a string, user ID, and then output would be a user object. So if it's something that's very clear, uh, then you can leave it be. Uh, if it's a primitive, you can obviously leave it be. But if it's something complex, you actually might just write a quick JSON for the signature of what this is. Uh, so your API should definitely have those, uh, especially the one that's required for you to tell an end-to-end -end story about your system design. Uh, and then the other thing is a schema, right? So if you're dealing with a stock, so here is the most popular sound, sound cache. I may have something like some um, let's think about it. So um, let's say uh, duration key, right? And then I may have the object, this, this will be the key. And I may have the object being a list of, or maybe I will say a map of down uh, and uh, count, counter, right? So, or a sorted list, sorry. Sorted list of sound to, to, to the counter. Or maybe I even use JSON to write it down, right? So here we would have a, a duration bucket key, right? And then I may have a, a list like this. I may have within there objects that will be sum equals to something and then counter uh, equals to something. So this basically gave a general idea, like we're sort of aggregating uh, most popular sum, right? And then given maybe a certain bucket um, durations, I will have the structure in here. So either write it down uh, kind of like a, a Java signature or use an example, both ways are fine. Um, say, same thing for databases. Uh, if you're using a relational database, it's a good idea to just write one for each table and then which one is the primary key? Uh, what are some of the key indexes you're gonna put in there uh, if it becomes important? But as you build your system design, you are able to then capture the really key information. Um, and uh, skip over the stuff that's not relevant, but leaving room for them. So at the end of the day, when your diagram is complete, uh, or when the, when the interviewer is looking at you and listening to you talk, uh, he or she can actually know what you're doing and what each of the component does without constantly asking you uh, to remind them what they are. And also you can avoid a lot of verbal discussion, which does take a lot of time. Uh, so yeah, so thank you for listening today. This is a quick learning talk about drawing diagram in system design. This is my way of doing it. So you may have your own favorite way and we can certainly discuss. But if you're like, I want to know a way that works, um, I would highly recommend you giving this a try. Thank you.